All right, well, welcome everyone. We have uh, hit the noon hour, so now is the time when we will commence the March 25th, 2021 edition of the weekly COVID situation update for the community. Um, as many of you know, I'm Brittany Cadence, Communications Manager with Peterborough Public Health, and uh, we are very appreciative to have you join us today. Uh, special thanks to our media guests and to our many uh, elected officials who've been able to join us today. We have with us Mayor Andy Mitchell, uh, Mayor Diane Terrian, and MP Miriam Monsef, and um, Warden Jones from the county. So thrilled to have you with us. So as we uh, enjoy this uh, lovely warm weather, uh, as the change of seasons comes to us, let's take a moment and, uh, and acknowledge uh, this beautiful land we call home. Uh, so we respectfully acknowledge that Peterborough Public Health is located on the Treaty 20 Michisagic territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisagic and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations, which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Beausoleil, and Georgina Island First Nations. Peterborough Public Health respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We are all treaty people. Okay, so now to um, start us off with some opening remarks, um, I'd like to invite Mayor Andy Mitchell and our Board of Health Chair to, uh, to start us off. Go ahead, Andy. Uh, thanks, Brittany. As the battle against COVID-19 continues and the vaccine offensive picks up steam, I recall the expression, the fog of war, and believe it is an applicable phrase for the period we are in. Most of us want certainty at a time when the only constant is that nothing is certain. It is one of the reasons that this pandemic has been so difficult for so many for so long. The questions being asked are many. When will I be able to get my shot? Is the vaccine I'm offered safe? Is my region being left behind in vaccine distribution? Can I alter my behavior once I'm vaccinated? Can my vaccinated mom and dad visit for Easter or Passover? Can they hug the grandkids? When can my business serve more customers? Decisions need to be evidence-based, yet the evidence is often evolving. And as a result, what is recommended we do today sometimes may need to change tomorrow. The pandemic has not provided scientists or political leaders the luxury of an entirely deliberative approach, but has required flexibility and a willingness and need to quickly absorb new information. There are some things, however, that should guide us going forward. The virus spreads through human contact. The more contact there is, the more cases there will be. Vaccines help protect you, your family, and your community. Take the first vaccine offered. There will not be an abrupt end of public health measures, but a gradual return to normal. Sound public health guidelines and economic well being are not mutually exclusive, they are complementary and depend on each other. Hindsight will always be 2020. Foresight is much more difficult and is what we will need in the days ahead. Stay safe, be well, and in all things, be kind. Thank you very much, Andy. Okay, so to walk us through um, the latest statistics, I'd now like to invite Dr. Salvatera, our Medical Officer of Health. Please go ahead, Dr. Salvatera. Thank you, Brittany, and thank you so much, Andy. Uh, so as of 4.30 p.m. yesterday, there were 55 active cases, uh, which is the same number that we reported last Thursday. Our total case count stands at 828 cases to date. So that's 51, uh, sorry, 41 more than last week. Uh, we also have had an, an additional 39 cases with, that have been identified as variants of concern reported to us in this past week. So that brings that number up to 165. 
Uh, I should note that yesterday, one of our uh, VOC cases was transferred to another health unit. So that's why our local number dropped by one, just in case you were wondering. The number of high risk close contacts that we are following continues to fluctuate as it is affected by the setting in which new cases are detected. Recently, there have been cases connected to area schools, and they certainly generate uh, a long list of potential exposures based on whether or not uh, students or staff were in the before or after school program or whether they were on buses or uh, in classrooms. So right now, our team here at Peterborough Public Health is following 200 high-risk contacts which is 57 more than last week at this time. Our local number of COVID-related deaths remains at 10. Next slide, please. Here we see the bar graphs uh, indicating the weekly number of cases, and you can see that uh, there continues to be a modest decrease. For the week of March 15th, we had 48. Uh, new cases. Uh, so far this week, we've had 13. However, things can change very quickly over the weekend. If I can go to the next slide, uh, here we see the monthly cases, and you can see that March is on pace to be one of our highest monthly case counts so far in the pandemic, uh, if not the highest. There have been 178 new cases reported so far this month. Next slide, please. When we look at our exposures, oh, here we see the, okay, thank you. Uh, the exposures, we see that, um, sorry, you're showing the total cases by onset date, which I think illustrates that we are still increasing and certainly not plateauing as we would like to see. And if we could go to the next, Slides. Thank you, Brittany. Here we see the breakdown of our exposures and consistently uh, with previous weeks, the largest proportion identified through contact tracing or high risk contacts. Okay, next slide will show you our outbreaks. We have three active outbreaks at the moment uh, and they are at the Brock Mission where we have one case remaining in self-isolation. Uh, we have the Empress Gardens, where there are three active cases, and uh, so far uh, none of those have been identified as a variant. And we have an outbreak at uh, Trent University uh, Zosky College, where we now have had a total of 14 cases reported so far, 10 of which remain active. Uh, and uh, most of those cases are in fact uh, testing as uh, presumed variants of concern. We have a little good news to share, and that is that both the outbreaks at Severn Court and at Champlain College were declared over yesterday. We've also rescinded the Section 22 orders that were uh, enforced in, at those sites and associated with those outbreaks. Thank you. Next slide, please. For case incidence rate, here you can see in the on the right hand side that our weekly case incidence rate is currently at 25 cases uh, per hundred thousand, which is um, which is which, which is a, a little um, uh, increase, a marginal increase from last week. Uh, and I just want to say that. Um, Peterborough right now, we're, we're walking a bit of a tightrope uh, in that we're, we're trying to uh, contain the outbreak uh, and certainly uh, not go any further, not go into gray and, and remain at least in red, um, but that uh, it is, uh, we continue to see uh, outbreaks uh, being declared uh, and we are not getting that downward trend that we really need in order to uh, to to move to uh, a color of of le with less restrictions. I think what's really important to recognize for us in Peterborough is that it's because 
of the variants of concern. They're just so much more transmissible. Uh, now we know they're more lethal as well with research emerging. Uh, and so we uh, really are depending on those measures related to the red zone to help keep us from going into gray or into lockdown. Next slide, please. Here are the uh, assigned color zones uh, for each region with Peterborough uh, remaining in the red for now. And then I do want to show share with you uh, additional surveillance data from our wastewater um, monitoring, which is uh, happening uh, three days a week at the uh, Peterborough wastewater treatment plant. And you can see that the latest data in the blue uh, in the blue bars uh, indicates that we have ongoing transmission, ongoing infection here in Peterborough. So certainly uh, it, we, we are not at a point where we can ease up on any of our measures just yet. Okay, next slide is uh, some good news to share with you that we have ad administered over 24,000 doses uh, in Peterborough in all of our, when we, when we add up all of our efforts uh, and including our clinics, and this is more than 10,000 more than where we were in the past week. So great progress being made there. Thank you. So I'll go on to make some additional remarks, and there are really two topics I wish to cover today, uh, and that's one is an update on the AstraZeneca vaccine, and then also uh, another regarding spring. Spring has sprung, and uh, I'd like to give you an update on the state of public health measures as we go, uh, as we move into spring. So first, let's meet, let me begin with AstraZeneca. There's been a lot of news coverage recently about its safety and its effectiveness. As you can see in this slide, AstraZeneca protects very well against severe disease and hospitalization. The European Medicines Agency and the UK Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency have investigated connections to uh, thromboembolic events or blood clots and have concluded that the vaccine is not associated with an increase in overall risk of blood clots. Uh, there is no evidence of a problem related to any specific batches of the vaccine or any particular va manufacturing sites. However, the vaccine may be associated with, uh, uh, with a very rare cases of clotting in the vessels draining blood from the brain. And there have been very rare cases of these unusual blood clots that uh, ha were accompanied by low levels of platelets after a vaccination. And platelets are the part of the blood that helps us to clot. Uh, the reported cases in Europe were almost all in women under the ages of 55. Uh, so I have uh, read news that, uh, that this rare event can be treated if it's identified early. Uh, and these investigations continue, and I expect that there will be uh, additional messaging, both for the general public on risk, and also for healthcare providers regarding the management of this very rare event. I think a useful way to think about AstraZeneca and think about COVID vaccines is, uh, is uh, by sharing an analogy that was coined by family physician, uh, Dr. Peter Lin in Toronto, who compared AstraZeneca vaccine to peanut butter. No one questions the overall safety of peanut butter, but we do know that in very rare instances, some people can have a strong and even a life-threatening reaction to it. So it makes sense to find out how to identify these indiv individuals and to recommend to them other more safe options. Uh, it's important to understand that the safety and effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccines is very good. The bottom line is that because COVID-19 is so serious or can be so serious and is so widespread, the benefits from getting the vaccine to prevent severe disease outweigh 
the risks of these very rare side effects. So as I said, I expect to hear more about the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, certainly hear more about our provincial supplies as they increase and as it becomes more available, uh, both at pharmacies and in health uh, providers' offices. Here in Peterborough, our primary care providers are completing their pilot uh, by April 2nd. I have been advised that we can expect local pharmacies will be given a supply for people age 60 and over, but we are still waiting for details and timelines on that. So while you're waiting for a vaccine, I encourage you all to review the consent form on our website. And if you have any questions, to book a consultation with your healthcare provider. So let's turn our attention now to spring and all the positive things associated with it. For public health, it means that vaccination clinics will continue to ramp up as we receive more vaccine. It also means that Easter and Passover are just around the corner. The safest approach for everyone to enjoy these celebrations is to stick to your immediate household members only. And even if you are outdoors with those from other households, please consider wearing a mask or a face covering if you are spending time together outdoors. And please remember that you must maintain physical distancing at all times. Needless to, needless to say, please remain vigilant. And remember, do not socialize if you are not feeling well. Peterborough Public Health has been in contact with our local churches and places of worship regarding COVID-19 requirements and precautions. If you plan to attend a religious ceremony, you are required to follow the COVID-19 safety plan that that facility has established. And you must wear a mask or a face covering at all times while indoors. If there are outdoor rituals associated, I recommend that masks stay on. This is in addition to the requirement to keep your distance from anyone with whom you don't live. The Ontario government continues to discourage travel outside of your home region, unless it's for essential uh, purposes, such as work or for a medical appointment. Social gatherings are not advised at this time and are subject to strict limits of five people indoors. Physical distancing must be maintained between any individuals who do not live together. As we welcome the warm weather, it's a great opportunity to get outdoors. Find a local park or a trail or some recreation, but remember, Physical distancing is one of the best ways to prevent the spread of COVID-19. If the area is busy, return at another time uh, and wear a face covering if distancing is a challenge, even if you are outdoors. If you plan on visiting local food premises, many are starting to open up their outdoor dining areas. Remember that you are only permitted to sit with your immediate household members, uh, whether you are indoors or outdoors, and that you will be required to attest to that, as well as to provide your name and your contact information. Our local restaurants have implemented COVID-19 safety plans and have taken steps to help ensure that you are able to dine safely and enjoyably. For many of us, spring is the time that we crank open the windows and air out our winter blues and deep clean and declutter our homes. You may be thinking about hosting a yard sale for, and for some, the yard sale season and bargain hunting may bring uh, a certain sense of excitement. There is some good information on our website to help you do so safely while we remain in the red zone. So I hope that helps to clarify what public health measures are expected of us all as we welcome this change in seasons.
Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Salvatera. Lots of great information there today. Um, OK, so now we'll have a chance to hear from our elected officials who uh, are joining us. And I would like to welcome um, our MP, Miriam Monsef, if she's got some comments to share from the federal government. Uh, and I'm happy to put you on screen if your camera is cooperating today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brittany. Hello, colleagues. Bonjour, Anin. Salam alaikum from my basement in Michisagi, Anishinaabeg Territory. Uh, many thanks to you, Brittany, to Dr. Salvatera, and to Chair Mitchell for your important work. Uh, Dr. Salvatera, thank you for the sobering news of increases in uh, rates, uh, but also thank you for the good news. Uh, that balance helps. 24,309. That number I'm going to write down in my journal because it's only possible because so many are working together. I'm going to focus my remarks on vaccines and I will have a big smile on my face and gratitude in my heart for the people on the front lines of administering these vaccines. Our vaccine shipments have continued to ramp up over the past several weeks. More than 2 million doses between Pfizer and Moderna are scheduled to arrive this week with another 1.2 million doses of Pfizer doses scheduled to arrive next week. We're also expecting one and a half million AstraZeneca doses that we secured from the United States to arrive next week. This will bring our total in Q1 deliveries to nine and a half million, well in excess of the 6 million originally anticipated. And I'd like to thank my colleague, Minister Anand, for all the amazing work she's done to secure these increases in shipments and the Prime Minister. Throughout April, we're scheduled to receive approximately 1 million doses of Pfizer each week, and we're scheduled to receive two shipments of Moderna for a total of 2 million doses. We're also working with the Serum Institute in India to finalize the delivery schedule of the remaining one and a half million AstraZeneca doses that we've purchased from them. We'll let everyone know when that schedule is finalized, but we do anticipate receiving a large portion of those in April. I also want to address a few vaccine related stories that have been in the news this week. Regarding this week's scheduled shipments of the Moderna vaccine, I want to be clear, the province of Ontario will receive their full shipment of Moderna vaccines. As Minister Anand has stated, there is no reduction. To help expedite the delivery of vaccines earlier in the week, the shipment was broken into two separate deliveries. The first one has already arrived and the second shipment is scheduled to arrive on Saturday. I also want to address the news coming out of Europe regarding increased control on vaccine exports. I can tell you that my colleagues are in regular conversation with their counterparts in the EU. These relationships we've built over the past five years and their strong relationships. Our government's been in contact with our counterparts in the EU, and they have assured us that these measures are not intended to disrupt Canada's vaccine shipments. We've also been in contact with our counterparts in India and have similarly been assured that measures there are also not intended to disrupt Canada's vaccine shipments. Canada has secured the most diverse vaccine portfolio in the world, and we are on track to ensure that every Canadian who wants a vaccine receives one by the end of September. The right vaccine for you is the first one available to you. They are safe, and I'm so grateful to hear that some 24,309 uh, doses have gone into arms in Peterborough. I know that there are many families breathing a sigh of relief in this beautiful spring weather we're enjoying, but there is more work to be done by all of us to prevent the spread of variants. And I really hope we can hang on just a little bit longer. This summer will be a good summer, but as Peterborough residents, 
city and county, we get to decide how how good that summer is going to be. So stay vigilant. And before I go, I'll leave you with an invitation. Next Wednesday, March 31st, Dr. Tam and other officials will be hosting a virtual Q&A town hall related to COVID-19 vaccines. You can find more information on the Healthy Canadians Facebook page, or you can reach out to my office and we will provide you with details. Take good care, everybody. Thank you so much, Miriam, and thank you for that very reassuring news about the uh, consistent flow of vaccine into the country. Uh, so now let's hear from our municipal uh, officials, and I'd love to give uh, Warden Jones a chance to to start us off with the county perspective. Go ahead, Warden Jones, if you've got something well, to share. Well, thank you very much. It's a delight to be here today, and uh, I, I thank you for involving the county. Uh, things are good. I bring greetings from everyone at Peterborough County, the staff and members of council, and more importantly, the 55,000 people who call themselves uh, residents of Peterborough County. We're certainly all doing the, the very best we can do. We continue to thank uh, Rosanna for the hard work that she's doing to uh, take charge of the situation for us. And we just gotta be patient. We've just gotta hold on a little bit longer. I had the opportunity for a couple of days to watch the people go in and out at uh, the Evanrude Center getting vaccinations. My wife has, has involved in, in, as an RN to uh, help out in that. And uh, just seeing the, the people who walk out of there, you know, you see the smile on their face and it really does give you hope that there is light at the end of this tunnel and we can't lose sight of that. I also want to put a little bit of a salute out to our good friends in Norwood. We've probably all heard by now that the uh, Norwood Fair has been canceled again for the second year in a row. Extremely disappointing. The Norwood Fair is the the epitome of a of a county event. It always has been, and it always it always will be. But hats off to the volunteers who put so much work into planning for this, where they get. I think they must get a half a million people showing up in Norwood. And uh, they're doing the right thing. They really are doing the right thing and being safe. And we'll get back to normal, I'm sure, in 2022. But but let's not criticize the, the good folks in Norwood. Uh, they're doing the right thing. They're being part of the solution, not part of the problem. So... Let's all just kind of work together and, and get through this and let's try to smile. Now, I heard a rumor that uh, Chair Andy Mitchell uh, for Easter was going to dress up as the Easter Bunny and hand out masks. Now, I don't know if anyone can confirm that, but it's just a little something I heard. Andy, if that's the case, then uh, uh, more power to you. It'll certainly keep you hopping throughout the Easter time. Thanks, everybody. On behalf of Peterborough County, we're with you. Thank you for everything you're doing. And we're all in this together. Thanks. Thank you very much, Warden Jones. And uh, yes, we'll definitely have to uh, keep our eyes open for any sightings of bunny costumes. Um, let's uh, hear from uh, Mayor Tarion from the city of Peterborough. If you've got some comments for us, please go ahead, Mayor Tarion. Thank you very much, Brittany, and thanks, everybody. Um, just a couple of things. You might have seen that uh, General Committee is having a special meeting on Monday to talk about the downtown built environment. So we're planning for the summer, planning for the nicer weather. We know that a lot of downtown businesses want to be able to offer uh, safe patio seating for those members of you know, your immediate household that you might want to dine with. Um, so we're going to be looking at that on, on Monday and figuring out a plan to have the downtown be reconfigured again this summer to be accessible and safe for uh, everyone. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Again, with the nicer weather, you know, there's lots of interest in being outside on parks and, and trails. And as Dr. Salvatierra said, we are supportive of that. But again, just be conscious and mindful and smart of um, physical distancing and uh, continue to respect those, um, respect those boundaries because we are, you know, getting through this and there is light at the end of the tunnel, uh, same as the sun is out shining today, uh, but we need to work together to make sure that we keep on this good path. Um, so that's it for me for now. Thank you very much. Brittany, back over to you. 
OK, great. Thank you very much, Mayor Tarion. All right, so now it's a chance to hear from our, our media colleagues. So um, I'm going to um, invite uh, Matt Latour to begin by asking questions um, of Dr. Salvatera. And uh, go ahead, Matt. Oh, is Matt able to join? Oh, there you are. Are you able to join us, Matt? Oh, there we go. OK, um, okay. I actually have just one question today, but it's for MP Monsef if she's still on the line. Oh, OK. I will. Uh, is is um, MP Monsef able? Oh, I may. I think she may have had to dash off. <sighs> All right, no worries. I can message her uh, her office about it then. That's it for me. Thank you. Oh, OK. All right. Uh, good stuff. So let's um, hear from Paul Rellinger then from Kawartha now. If you've got some questions for Dr. Salvatera, please go ahead. Thanks so much, Brittany. I do um, for Dr. Salvatera. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we've heard, or I've heard, I don't know if other people have, of reports of Peterborough residents, Peterborough area residents going out of town to try and get the vaccine, whether it be at pharmacies in Toronto or wherever there's clinics. But they may have been out of town for another reason, but that's what they're trying to do, or maybe they're doing it specifically. Um, we heard as recently as today. Uh, the the advice remains don't leave the region don't travel but yet you know this is happening so what what's your response to that what do you what do you say to these people obviously you know they're they're willing and they want to get the vaccine as soon as possible uh but yet uh what they're doing kind of flies in the in the face of uh of you know protocols that have been already handed down so for the AstraZeneca vaccine, the province announced last Friday that they're going to make it available for anyone over the age of 60, and it will be provided through pharmacies. We have been assured that every health unit will get at least three pharmacies that will be supplied with AstraZeneca. So on the AstraZeneca, I'm going to ask people just to be a little patient. It may take a couple of weeks. As we heard from MP uh, Monsef, the AstraZeneca supply that's coming, the 1.5 million doses is due to arrive next week. That's going to come at least 600,000 to Ontario, and we should have a, a good supply through our pharmacies and potentially through primary care as well. So a little a bit of patience, not much longer. Uh, as far as accessing the mass immunization clinics, I do know that we had some hiccups again this week as the province opened up the gates to people 75 plus, that we had some issues with getting all of our clinics on, on the uh, booking system and that some there were uh, earlier this week, our local clinics were not showing up and people were being offered appointments in Coburg or Belleville. So uh, I'm, uh, I understand if some people uh, made that decision and, and traveled for their vaccine, I apologize. Uh, we do have vaccine here locally, and I would just suggest that if the booking system isn't working for you online, that you try uh, getting some phone assistance. Sometimes that's a little more timely and they can, uh, they'll know what's happening if we're down. And uh, even if you need to just leave it for a day and come back, often these problems are resolved very quickly. So uh, assurances to everyone that there is, there will be vaccine available in Peterborough uh, and, uh, and you shouldn't have to travel for it. Uh, perfect, uh, thank you, Dr. Salvatore. I had uh, one more question regarding vaccines. Again, uh, seen on social media and, and heard from a few people that they've been receiving emails to set up an appointment. Uh, to your knowledge, is that something they, they well, first of all, they shouldn't be answering these emails. Is it is it your knowledge that that is happening or are people should they be getting a direct phone call? Well, Paul, that's the, what you're describing is the back door to the booking system. And it's the way that we can actually curate lists and provide these lists to the clinic at PRHC to offer immunization. So, for example, that's what we've been doing with healthcare workers as they've been prioritized, is that we've been providing those lists and with email addresses, which would then result in someone receiving an email from the PRHC clinic advising them that they can book an appointment. So they are legitimate, uh, and it is one of the ways that we are getting at some of these other priority groups where uh, we are able to offer vaccines. 
that's good to know because people get leery um, when, they, when they get emails as opposed to a phone call. Uh, I have one more question and I'll be the elephant in the room here and ask again, uh, anything new on the Severn Court investigation that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of and I don't I don't know if Chief Gilbert is with us today. Uh, I think he is. Um, okay. Do you have some comments to share Chief Gilbert or we can talk later? I do, and uh, the investigation is uh, not bearing fruit at this time. As uh, we said before, we're dealing with a situation of a lot of private medical information. Uh, it's a Provincial Offences Act investigation. We're unable to do production orders related to the information. We have attempted one search warrant, and that was refused by the judiciary for medical information, which is in the hands of Peterborough Public Health. So it is a conversation that I'm going to have to have with Dr. Salvatera and her staff at a future time. If this persists, um, we'll probably have to, if that if that's the case, then we'll have to hand it back over to public health since they have the majority of the information that we're unable to obtain through legal sources. Um, we have spoken to a number of people at the school and uh, or rather a number of students and they all insist that Amazingly, that there was nine or less at uh, any of the parties, or that they've uh, had some issues with recalling whether or not they were there. Hopefully, their uh, memory lapses don't occur during uh, their final exams coming up in April. Uh, thanks so much, Chief. I I, I I appreciate your patience on having to answer uh, that question every week. I I do appreciate it. No, it's uh, it's quite expected, Paul, and. Uh, uh, have no problem answering the questions as best we can. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have all the answers that uh, we'd like to be able to give the public as well as the media at this time. And it's not through a lack of trying, it's uh, just from a lack of being able to obtain the information from uh, legal sources. Terrific. Uh, thank you so much, Chief, and uh, thank you, Dr. Salvatera and Brittany. That's all I have. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, so let's hear from Taylor Clydesdale from Peterborough this week. If you've got some questions for Dr. Salvatera, please go right ahead. Hi, yes. Uh, thank you so much, Brittany. Uh, actually, I just have a question then for uh, Chief Gilbert. Just a question of clarification um, based off of your previous comments. Um, but if the health, uh, if the Peterborough Police is unable to get uh, information to continue its investigation, you said it would be handed back to the health unit. What, what exactly does that mean? It means just that uh, Peterborough Public Health, uh, I believe, has the information. They've been doing contact tracing relative to those that were involved in the outbreak. They know who the identified uh, individuals are that were required to be quarantined after their positive tests. And uh, since it is uh, medical information and it is protected information, uh, Peterborough Public Health would be handed that back once we've exhausted all of our abilities to obtain the information through legal sources. Um, that being said, uh, it would be up to Peterborough Public Health at that time whether or not they were going to take any enforcement action against any of the involved students. But that's a conversation that uh, we'll have to have with public health down the road as I said, once we've exhausted all possible means. Okay, so the possibility of uh, 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 being summoned to court and legal charges for these individuals, that would still be on the table then? There is still a possibility that Provincial Offences Act charges could be laid, whether it's by us or public health down the road, uh, that remains to be seen. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chief. I appreciate the help. Um, I'm just going to uh, uh, ask Dr. Salvatera these next couple of questions. Um, in regards to the Severn Court outbreak, uh, how many cases total did that end up yielding uh, at by the end of that outbreak? Uh, I don't have that information with me with, uh, today, but we certainly can get it to you. We have it. Okay. Um, moving on then to uh, vaccinations, um, just playing a little bit of catch up on um, 
uh, the vaccination plan right now. So what populations have been completely vaccinated in Peterborough and what populations are, are still on the agenda for being vaccinated? Well, we're still, uh, we're still immunizing our over 80s. They continue to come to our clinics. They, uh, as of March 15th, that we open that up to them and they are, we are continuing to see them in our clinics. And then as of this week, uh, we opened up to the 75 and overs and they continue to come. So we're not completed either of those age groups yet, but we're making good progress. Uh, in addition, I, I think the ones we've completed, certainly the second doses to our long-term care home residents, they're done. Uh, and we will be going back and doing second dose, second doses to our retirement home residents. So they all had their first dose. Uh, we'll be going back and completing second doses in retirement homes and in seniors congregate settings. They'll be done in the next couple of weeks. Um, we continue, we've done first doses for our First Nations and are working with them now, planning for second doses. Uh, I know we've done for we we haven't completed first doses yet for our urban indigenous population. They are still planning another clinic for uh, more first doses for that population. We I know we've done some of our home care uh, patients, but uh, that population continues to come in for immunization. And then of course we've completed our highest priority and our high. Uh, very high and high priority healthcare workers. Uh, we are now um, inviting moderate priority healthcare workers to be uh, immunized. So, um, so we're working on that group right now. And how does it feel to be at this point where, you know, we have 24,000 doses of the vaccine administered and it's looking like, you know, we're thousands of more are just on the horizon. I, where, how does it feel? I feel like I need more vaccine, Taylor, to be honest with you. We could be doing more here if we had more vaccine. We certainly have the capacity in our clinics to be, uh, to continue to see um, lots and lots of, of people. Uh, and so our, our biggest issue is supply. And um, we, I have asked for more for Peterborough. I don't know if we'll get more. I, I'm sure there's lots of medical officers of health asking for more vaccine. So I, I just wish I had more vaccine. That, that's how I feel. Okay. I think that's everything for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Salvatera. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Taylor. Okay, I'm going to invite uh, Joelle Kovach from The Examiner, uh, who's joining us today. If you've got some questions for Dr. Salvatera, go right ahead. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, the outbreak at Severn Court and Champlain Colleges have been lifted, you said. Um, are people who live there who are well now allowed to come and go at will or, or you, yes. you said that the restrictions are over, right? Yes, so we rescinded the, the order, which, um, which uh, did um, mandate that people stay at home uh, or self-isolate. That now has been removed. Okay, that, that's great. Um, I, I don't think I really understand the complexity of that investigation. Like there was discussion just now about how um, it involves like some people's medical information. Why would you need to know if someone's positive or not? Like, is it about that or is it about who organized a party? I mean, I, well, I don't quite get I, it. I think what uh, Chief Gilbert was referring to is that uh, as, as part of our case and contact investigation and management, we collect information, but it's considered personal health information. And as a health information custodian, I am legislated, I have provincial legislation that does not allow me to disclose that information without consent or to use it for other purposes for which it was not intended. And so, um, and that's why, for example, you know, we often get requests from the media 
to disclose where outbreaks are occurring. And, and I, I, I have to be careful as a health in, information custodian. I, I can't disclose unless there's a, there's an, a public health uh, issue that really requires that disclosure. So uh, we are not uh, permitted to share that information or to use it for other purposes. And that is creating a bit of an obstacle for the investigations that are being done for the purposes of enforcement. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, I, I just, I, in, is, the, is there not an investigation into who organized the party? Like, does that matter or doesn't it? To me, that, that seems to be the question, right? But it doesn't, that doesn't, that's not what's being investigated. I believe the police are trying to do that, but as you heard from Chief Gilbert, they're getting different stories and inconsistent stories, which makes it very difficult, very challenging for them. Okay, that's exactly what I need, thanks. That's really, really helpful. Okay, I'll allow you to move on, thanks. And if I could just add to that, to Dr. Salvatera's comments, it's it's, Yes, there's an enforcement piece that everybody would like to see happen. And I, I agree with that. However, it's much more important that public health uh, be able to have honest conversations with people without them worried about uh, potential reprisals. If they have, uh, you know, if a person has those fears dealing with public health, then quite honestly, public health contact tracing efforts to limit the spread or to prevent further contact in the community are going to go for naught because people will be afraid even to talk to them. And uh, I get that people are going to wonder and, and be a little bit confused about all of this, but there's really three distinct uh, investigations that, that are going on. One, Provincial Offences Act by the police, the public health contact tracing, and then even uh, Fleming University or Fleming College rather with their student tribunals. Those are three separate things and the information isn't being shared amongst the, the three, um, basically because each is a protected investigation. Thank you, Chief Gilbert for adding. I think that really helps. Yeah, it does. Thank you very, very much. That does make it much more clear. Okay, I'm not Okay, thank you, Joelle and and Chief Gilbert. Uh, so let's hear now from Jessica Nisnik from Global News. If you've got some questions for Dr. Salvatera, please go right ahead. Thanks, Brittany. I do have questions for Dr. Salvatera. I have uh, just some regarding, obviously, the everyday COVID stuff that we're talking about. And then also um, afterwards, a question about uh, the budget and what kind of money is coming in, and that's for a colleague. So I'll start with... Um, what, with the, um, the the issues that were happening with COVAX and people being sent to other areas, you're saying that's been worked out. Was it was it just a hiccup or was it a lack of spaces available here in Peterborough? Uh, it was mostly a hiccup, Jessica, uh, uh, more than one hiccup. And uh, I would say a, a succession of hiccups that led to the situation. But as I also stated, I believe that was resolved as of yesterday morning. I understand people are, were able to be booking into local clinics. And, uh, and so um, I think it's just a matter of something new and we're just learning, we're just really trying to, to, to figure out how to make it work better. Uh, so many of my viewers will be happy to hear that. Um, they love to write in and call. So um, also, originally you said that the Evan Rood Center I saw on the website for the 80 plus would run maybe until March 27th. Is is that, that's originally what it said on the website. Is that just going to continue? Like is, is the Evan Rood Center where we're just going to keep giving immunizations or is there an end date for that? And, and will the one that was in Norwood, is that going to move around in the county? So the plan is that we will always have uh, at least one mass immunization clinic in the city. Currently, that is the Evan Rood. And, uh, but we have to be cognizant that the hospital 
um, has uh, made plans to use the Evinrood Centre for a field hospital if they uh, are unable to cope or need more space, additional space for patients. So we are aware of that. And if that happens, we will need to move to a different location. And currently, the Wellness Centre is, is our second location in the city uh, if we need to move. Uh, we also will have various locations throughout the county. We're trying to move it around on purpose to make it accessible, more accessible to different of our to different parts of our of our county. So uh, we are looking at potential sites in Buckhorn and in Apsley, potentially Millbrook. Uh, so uh, we will uh, let people know uh, when those sites are uh, identified and when they will be running. Thank you. So you're at the Evan Road until you get until further it. notice. Right. Um, OK, and so I have noticed as I drive by work every day, a long lineup outside the Evan Road every day. Can you maybe fill me in on, on what's happening there? I know seniors love to show up early. Is yes. that the case? Yes, so we have very eager, excited uh, seniors who are uh, who are arriving well before their appointments and we are asking them to stay in their cars their vehicles until five minutes before their appointment because that's all it takes essentially you walk in you're you sit in a chair and you're immunized right then and there um, however what happens is that seniors because we're, uh, they see other people lining up and then they get nervous uh, and so they start to line up as well. I think we've worked out a system. We now have a big board out front of the Evan Roos, uh Center, which tells you which time, which appointment time we are now allowing people to walk in for. And I think that has reduced the numbers of people who feel they need to get into a line. I think part of it too might be good weather, Jessica. I think some people are just enjoying being out and seeing other people. Uh, potentially, uh, I know with men, because I've been at the Evan Root and I have been immunizing, some of these seniors have been in their homes for over a year. So I, some of it might just be good weather as well. Well, I've seen a few that are quite decked out to go to the immunization clinic. Um, okay, that helps. So, so if say if someone's twentieth in line, but their appointment is at, on time, they still go to the door for their appointment. They don't have to get in that line. There's no lineup. So, for example, uh, just if we have twelve immunizers on site, then we would have twelve appointments every five minutes. And as I said, um, you just need to go to the door five minutes before your appointment uh, because we don't want lineups. We need to keep everyone spaced out. Uh, and that's when it works the best is when you show up five minutes before your appointment and then you'll go in and you'll be pre-read, you'll be read, you'll be registered again and you'll be taken to a chair by a friendly volunteer. And before you know it, there'll be an immunizer there to give you your vaccine. Great, thank you. Um, what was I gonna say lastly? Uh, Taylor, I think it was Taylor or was it? No, it was Paul had asked about this. You know, that that some people are able to go to other cities and get the vaccine if they want to. And I do know that some people have traveled as far as Kingston. Do you, rec I know you said just hold on. Is, is that what you recommend? Do you want people going to other cities even though they can, or would you just want them to wait here? We're not supposed to be traveling. Well, that's that's right, Jessica. We are in the middle of a pandemic. And as we've all said before, this virus does not have legs. The only way it travels is with people. So we really should not be traveling. We should stay local. And I just want to reassure all of our Peterborough community that we will be getting more AstraZeneca in and that uh, the plan is that there will be availability through pharmacies. We'll let you know which ones. Uh, and uh, we also anticipate that primary care will also be uh, providing AstraZeneca as well. So we're in the pilot phase right now. And of course, we have to complete the pilot, uh, which it's due to complete April 2nd. We'll evaluate it and hopefully then the province will make further decisions about primary care and access to vaccine. Okay, last 
well, I'll say last question on this topic and then I'm going to go to the budget. Dr. Salvatera, I say in every story, once you're eligible, you remain eligible. Right. But I feel like that's getting missed and that's what the rush is and people are panicking because they think they need to get it right away. Do you want to just tell people again? Because they're, they're not listening to me. Well, I understand that people are eager to get vaccine. I, and I'm glad that people are eager to get vaccine. But there isn't, uh, there's, there is vaccine available and once you have been made eligible, you can get vaccine either right away or next week or next month. You never lose your eligibility. We don't close that door. It remains open so that you can get your vaccine when you're ready. Excellent. I also, before I move on, wanted to say I appreciated your comment when asked how you feel instead of it's great that you want more vaccine. That's very honest and I appreciate that. Now on to the budget. Um, Dr. Salvatera, provincial investment of 1 million in the vaccine plan, 2.3 million in contact tracing and testing and 1.4 million in PPE. Does, do you feel this is enough to get us through the final hump of the pandemic? Oh, well, I'm glad to see that there are resources being made available for all three areas because we need them all. We need PPE. And that's going to continue uh, until this pandemic is over and we have herd immunity. Um, we definitely need to continue the contact and case management because we continue to see people being infected, especially now that the variants are here. And I know even just this morning, I was speaking with my members of the executive committee about hiring more staff to assist us with case and contact management. Um, because I have staff who have not had a break. I've also got staff who are just very tired uh, and we need to be able to uh, bring in additional staffing resources. I'm glad to see, yes, that we, we do a need more resources to help get that vaccine out. Whether it's enough or not, I can't really comment. Uh, we have, uh, that really would be up to the province to make an assessment as to what all 34 local public health agencies need and uh, and then to be hopefully to be able to respond up until now Jessica we have been able to get uh, our uh, to have our expenses covered for our additional staffing additional efforts it's been going well so far so I hope that that'll be the case looking forward into the future okay that's it for me thank you Dr. Salvatore I know I asked you a lot of questions today my pleasure. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Jessica. Lots of good questions as always. OK, I see that uh, Trent Radio is joining us today. Is that Rob? Did you have some questions for Dr. Salvatera? Hi, yes, it is Rob, but I think everything that I have has been covered already, so thanks so much. OK, great. Um, and then um, we also have Reg Watson on the line from the examiner. Did you have any questions today, Reg? Dr. Salvatera, could you walk us through um, how priority works on vaccinations for people that have health conditions like younger people in the community? Um, how, how do you identify whether somebody is chronically in need of the vaccine earlier? And, and what does it mean for people who might be, say, diabetic or asthmatic? Do they get their vaccinations any earlier? How would that work so right now the the highest priority is age and we are making our way down through the ages the age groups and uh and so that is really important that we continue to do that because your age increase uh, your risk increases as your age increases and then as you have said there are people with chronic underlying conditions that increases their risk as well. So we have now uh, provincial guidance. We received it on Friday. Uh, and uh, if you uh, you can go online, it's been posted and you'll see that there are now there's a hierarchy of chronic conditions. There's very high risk, high risk, and then at risk. And according to priority, we are now, uh, uh, we, we are asked to begin to work with our healthcare partners to identify these people and to start making sure they have access to immunization. So that process has not begun yet in Peterborough. We're still waiting for provincial guidance as to 
who will be immunizing? Is this, this, is this going to be a role for our hospital partners, our primary care partners, or the specialty clinics themselves? Um, they have electronic medical records. These people can be uh, identified. People with diabetes, for example, can also be identified by their pharmacy right? Because the pharmacies know which medications are for what purpose, and they can also play a role in helping us to reach these populations. So we're still, we're, we're on the, I'd say on the threshold of getting a better idea of how and when these populations will be, um, be, will be vaccinated. Um, but for now, we have just the list that have been uh, provided to us. Uh, so I would say stay tuned on that one. And uh, hopefully we'll have uh, more information on that even at ne by next week. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, if, if that's it then Reg, um, then that wraps up uh, our questions from our uh, media guests. So uh, that also brings to an end uh, this week's COVID situational update and um, we look forward to seeing you back here uh, next week. Very pleased to see that'll be the first day of April so we'll be into uh, the warmer weather for sure I hope and um, for a copy of the video from this briefing you can always find them on our YouTube channel uh, usually by the end of the day of the briefing so just so you know you've got access to that. So thank you again everyone appreciate your time today and your comments and um, please stay safe out there we'll see you next week have a great weekend. Thank you Brittany. Thanks Brittany.